count the angels in. The physical ones are here. So the physical angels are here. So just got to get the heavenly ones to join us. Ian, would you stay seated? Would we just stand and we'll hold hands and say the Lord's Prayer? Ah. Come on, Levi, we'll... And for any, if there's any other latecomers, may they blessing extend to them as well. They're coming, yes. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Whew. That's a good hit. So nice. All them angels gathering around, can you feel it? <laughs> can you feel it? Oh, Jesus sandals, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking, I don't want to wear your shoes today. I, I, I'm inspired by Chris. I'm going to wear sandals today. Have you got today. your tan line yet? <laughs> You're an amateur. <laughs> <laughs> hang on, hang on. I, I'm working on it. Uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> You're an apprentice. <laughs> an apprentice. May I be a good apprentice. Yeah. Amen to that. Squeeze some more chairs in. What, what I think is, uh, personally, what I think is great news is that this Friday last week, I was able to order a box of 50 of these. It, it came to about 650, so I think we're all right there. Like, I, no need to get money well, spent. money well spent. A box of 50 of these, which means next year, I mean, anyone who wants their own copy at home, I would say, take one, just put in 12 bucks to cover the print of the book and some postage and we'll just give that back to the church but we're just going to leave them here we're going to leave copies here so if you want your own copy get one but we're going to leave copies here so when you turn up a sacred circle I won't have to print out these anymore we'll just grab it someone will have to remember where we're up to open up and we'll just get to work straight out of the, the book which will be exciting that's good and that to me was is two years of procrastinating as I'm happy to admit it <laughs> two years of procrastinating because they were ready two years ago to be printed, but they needed a deep edit, and I wasn't ready to do it. And then I finally got in and did the work. And like you said last week, Dan, oh, I think it was last week you said, there just comes a point where you've got to go, it is what it is, just make it happen, you know? And so that's, got those ordered, and I got an email yesterday to say they're posted already. They'll, be, they'll arrive in a few, few days. So I'll bring them here and we'll have them for next year. So right now we're in the, in the middle of doing part two we did, last month we did The Rich Fool, and that was an excellent session. I thought it was great. And we're doing part two because it's just such a big discourse from the Lord that it really had to be broken into two. But let's remember the wealth that the Lord is trying to highlight to, he, to us here is all about self. You know, when we become rich in our own ego, our own importance, self that's the kind of wealth that will stop us from entering into heaven right now. But when we get that side worked out, physical wealth is just a tool, a wonderful tool, a great tool that we can actually use to make the world a better place. And I'm, well done, come in. Join the circle. Oh no, you're just in time. The Lord's Prayer went out over you, so that's good. We haven't actually started. No. I know. <laughs> totally, totally. But we were just, just discussing how we did last month, Paul, we did part one of this parable. It's too big to do in, in one whole sit. And we're just talking about the fact that physical wealth, physical wealth is like the sensual. If you look in the Bible at the sensual, its archetype is a snake. It's interesting, isn't it? The sensual is a snake. And remember in the beginning, God made all things good. Snakes had their place. They were, they were good. But eventually it gets to become the archetype of hell and the devil. 
because it, it bites you. The sensual, we all know how our physical side can really give us trouble. But when you get the spiritual side in place, the physical just becomes an extension of that blessing. And the word Eden means delight. God made us for delight. That's such a good thing to realise. And so wealth is just an extension of that. Money, wealth, materialism, all that stuff is an extension of that. It only becomes a problem when we leave the spiritual out. What is my purpose? Why am I here? Why did I agree to this? When, when did I agree to this? You know, but, but here we are. We wake up here every day and let's make the best of it. And I'm utterly convinced if you'll make your life about improving other people's lives, wealth will come. It'll just flow in. That energy you need will be there to just flow in. Let's, can, let's begin. Who'd like to start? Would, could I go over that side, Jennifer? Would you mind reading through the parable and right on through and... said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed, and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will stow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy need. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself that is not rich towards God. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Beautiful. Thank you, Jennifer. That was lovely. Before we move on, is there anything that stood out to someone in that reading? Mm. The word is the Lord, and the Lord is the word, so it's something will probably have jumped out at you more more this time than maybe in a previous reading. Any any thoughts, comments? Um, what, is, um, covetous mean? what does covetous mean? Yeah, yeah we did that sort of went over that last month. Covetousness is a strong desire so strong that it takes over. Now you, you can be covetous for good or be rich towards good or rich towards God, same thing. And that's okay. In fact, that's what we are. Like you say, what is a human soul? It is desire. Come on, come on in, guys. Sally, Sally here? I've got her, I've got her copy here. <laughs> no. No, jump in. Right, you better sit. You better sit there. I think we've got enough. So, if you think about what we are, like what what are we? We are a spark from the divine. The divine is the all-consuming flame, and we are a spark. You're a part of God. You're not God, please, please, no. But you're a part of the divine, an eternal spark of the divine. And this is the incredible thing. If you had to describe what is the human soul, I would say it is desire. Isn't that an amazing thought? Every soul is desire. 
but we're each a unique expression of that. And we're each meant to become a unique expression of good and truth, our own expression of it. And in this way, God expands. Because God can't expand, he's infinite. But through us, he can. So we're, we're each desire. So uh, Levi said, what, what is covetousness? And we're talking about covetousness is basically the soul's energy to, to desire. And the Lord's saying here, be careful what you covet or be careful how you covet. You, know, you can't not covet. You're a soul. You're a soul. You're going to want to grow and expand and have things in your life. But it's being careful what you let that energy go after. That's the key here to this, to this parable. What's your energy going after? And, and, and you, the key again, something that stood out for me in this reading, is the self-talk. You know, the Lord is really getting us into this man's self-talk. Hmm, what am I going to do here? You know, I know. And we all have this self-talk, isn't it? You know, when you have a problem, you start having a conversation with yourself, don't you? And you start trying to figure out what I'm going to do here. And you wait for yourself to give yourself an answer, but really the answers are coming beyond, aren't they? They're coming from your soul group, those who've gathered around you to help you do this journey. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. So Swingbolt says we, uh, we are our greatest love. When you talk about desire, so he says whatever you love the most is what's going to come out. Yes. So to my mind, obviously that's true because uh, whatever we love the most, we choose those things. And he says, evil people, they think what they're doing is good because they love the things they do. So my question is... Well put, a, well put, Paul, by the way. It seems a bit like predestination. I know it's not, but mm -hmm. if someone, say for example, someone very lustful, uh, if that's their greatest love and desire, mm -hmm. then that's going to manifest in their life as one thing. So it seems like, so when it says like character is destiny, so... How does someone, when someone's born, I don't know how much that love is in them and when they're born and then it's ma manifested through their life. Because if they said if you're born that way, whatever it is, then it's all you'd be saying there. It would be like a predestination as in you're born. Your Great life. question, by the way. This is an excellent question, Paul. You're really thinking about this. Again, Sweden will help us understand hereditary evils. And get a hold of this. You're never judged for hereditary evils. You're not judged. Because judgment is just coming into the light of heaven and seeing what you've chosen. You judge yourself. When you come into the light of heaven and you see what you've chosen. So those hereditary evils were not your choice. Well, it seems like something's implanted in them. Yep. Say, for example, a gay person will say, I was born that way. So yep. I'm gay, so I live that way. I couldn't in be interested in heterosexual people because yep. this is where I was born. So same thing. If you're, I know we're all born into evil, but it seems as some people are seem to have uh, more selfish and all have evil, but it seems to be some seem to be a lot worse than others. So even though, so to my mind, yep. you might say, well, you're only going to be judged according to what you choose, but you're only going to be choosing from what you love. Yeah. So, if you, so if you love it, you're going to choose it. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, go, 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 please jump in. Yeah, so look at it very, very, very quite profound. Uh, good questions, aren't they? Very, yeah. very good question. And, and of course, th this is where this kind of balance is between in one sense, we do have a predestination in the same way that we all are born in a circumstance and with a background that has parameters that can't be changed. You know, in, in the way that the infinite kind of grows, not through expansion, but through getting more in, infinite. Through our expansion. Through our expansion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. as each generation comes, it, it's it's a, a more more detailed reflection or a component of the generation that went before. And so it's more, perhaps more specific, but in that detail, you know, we inherit, you know, predispositions and loves and things like that that we get as baggage, and that's basically within which we grow. And so, if you had to quantify, I don't know how you quantify, but let's say there's a million, million different societies in in the in the next in, in the spiritual world you know both evil or, 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 or could or be more in heaven but, but, could but, be more, might, might be more. <laughs> and, yeah. we're all, and we're all different right we're yeah. all the seven billion people on this planet there are seven billion different heavens effectively in in, 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 <laughs> well, in, 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 in that sense <laughs> yeah. Well, well yeah so so when you are born i suppose maybe 80 percent of those are already never going to be part of your picture because you'll never really connect with it because 
yeah, there's the baggage they can bring with them. But, but, but out of the rest of those, you still have a massive amount of free will and choice as to what you choose and what you don't choose but you bring with you. We have promised that that will be taken yes. away from us. Yes, because I need to clarify that your hereditary evils are never judged, but you still need to resist them. You can't just go into them. Reformation, new generation. Right. right. The thing is, uh, to break the programming yes. of being evil, you have to want to repent. Mm. If the people don't want to repent, yeah. therefore they're going to be stuck. Yeah. They're never going well, to be able to reform the new generation. I believe we all have the choice. choice. We all are given the opportunity over and over and over and over and over again. But they'll always choose not to because they don't want to. Well, hang on. I, I think we can get stuck on this word repentance. No, you're right. We get stuck. No, no, it's good. No, no, no. We, yeah, I'm keen. We're, 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 we're going to. This is what today's about. We'll do it. We get stuck on this word repentant. We'll come back. We get, d don't say repent, because none of us want to do that. In reality, we want to be who we are. But when you want to be different, when Paul comes to a place where Paul says, I don't want to be this Paul anymore, I want to be this Paul, that's repentance. That's saying, I don't want to just be this, I want to be something more. Yeah, reflection is real repentance, yeah, yeah, and, and what, what follows out of that reflection. Look, here's what I would say. Okay, let's do a little experiment. I'll say a word, and I want everybody just to quickly throw at me what comes up. If I say Batman, what's something? To Robin? Robin? Vengeance. Vengeance? Come on. <laughs> I'm looking for a certain word, but it's only me. There's no wrong words here. And it helped me. Sorry? Bat. Batman. No one said... I can't stand Batman, so you don't want to... No one said Joker. Or what about, en okay, let's try again. I'll say Batman. Tell me some enemies of Batman. Penguin. Mr. Freeze. Penguin, Mr. Freeze. Now we're getting somewhere. Riddler. Sorry, the Fiddler. Riddler. 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 Not the Fiddler, the Riddler. <laughs> Riddler. The Joker. Okay. So Batman wouldn't be Batman without his nemesis, would he? He wouldn't change. He never would have risen up to be Batman if he didn't have his... Action, reaction. So yeah. you, and that's an external force acts upon us. Yes. We don't change. Right. Who's saying the Judas then? Inside each one of us, yes. But you don't have to be that. You don't have to choose to be, the, unless you want to be the Judas. That's your choice. And so what the Lord does is he brings light in, enough light to keep us in freedom. He says it this way. In Deuteronomy he says, I place before you today good and evil. And it's like, choose, choose good. He kind of puts that in there as well, but it's still your choice. So the Lord brings enough light into our life to say, do, is this who you want to be or do you want to be something different? Now, the Lord's heart for us is to rise up and be the hero of our story. Okay, one last question. But we don't always get, you know, we don't, you know, we've got to choose. So the last question, say someone, say for example, homosexuality was the norm. If someone says, you have to be homosexual because that's the norm, I say, well, I can't because I'm heterosexual. Right. Uh, so I say my homosexual is, is, oh, you've got to get in the society, you've got to be heterosexual. And, right. You know, a lot of Christian homosexuals, they pray to take, to take away, to, but they never can. Mm -hmm. So to my mind, the same thing with these evils. Even if you've got that evil, it sounds like they can never change. I know God wants us to change, but it seems like some people... Yeah, we, oh, we didn't let Ian speak. Go. The difference between evil and sin. I think you do hear of stories, though, where people are on the wrong path and then something happens in their life and they have yeah. a wake-up call and mm -hmm. then, yeah. So for some people, they then are, do choose a better path. Well, it seems like something. it's a small percentage. But what, what, what's your litmus test? Like, how do I test who's had awakenings and ignored them and who has awakenings and followed them. It's, it's, it's hard to say. It only seems that way to us. Do you think that being homosexual is a sin? No, I'm just confused about that. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm questioning that myself. Is it? I don't know. Well, I don't think so, but I'm just saying, uh, it's, uh, my view is to take everything. Being homosexual or heterosexual is not the problem. The problem is what we choose on that. So, uh, so just on that one, my thought was, it's more likely to be promiscuous if you're homosexual. It doesn't mean you are, but all that, my point was, I think if someone's very evil, they seem to be stuck. Okay, can we just really make a distinction between evil and sin, though? Okay, because uh, I think that's, that's, a, that's a distinctly different, different thing, and it goes to your previous question as well about should it be a Judas? I mean, we are born in this natural environment to give us our sense of autonomy and independence. That false 
that, that, that is not the truth. We don't, we don't have autonomy. We're not autonomous. But that's the picture that comes with us. And by buying into that idea, we naturally take ownership over it. And that's the Judas effectively within us. Now, that effectively is evil because it's false. It, it's focusing on, on self preservation as opposed to the good which is what comes from God is that what is created naturally comes within us now everything in this world in that sense is in the one sense evil but sin is to choose evil knowing that it that that it is right and, and so me being like in the teenage years I don't have no better idea you know, I'm being kind of quite selfish, you know, whatever, or I accept that I'm by myself. That's kind of a living an evil life, but it, it's not a sin, right? So, but as soon as which, which by the way, Jesus says, if you were blind, you'd have no sin. But yeah. because you claim to see, yeah. you have sin. That's kind of what Exactly. So yeah. as, as you, if, you, if you agree and appreciate why it is evil or, or what is true, and then you still choose it, well, now it's part of you. Now you're really choosing to own that and it can't be taken away from you because you've taken ownership over it. If something has been within you and you feel you have no choice, but you don't necessarily choose it, that's not part of you. That it is something that, that's part of your baggage that you but carry. Because you love it. No, no, no. Well, well they, so, so... If they don't see the evil in it, uh, I guess the result... Well, another thing is that they love their evil, so they think that evil is good. Yeah. I know where you're coming from and I, what, I know where you're coming from and now we're probably at the point where we where spoke about this yesterday. Did he? Did he? Yeah. Short, I've, I've got it here. Get yeah. it for like a minute. Go. Yeah, exactly what you're talking about. Put near the microphones of the people on the, cam on the video community. Yeah. This is evil. Anytime you get around religion or you're talking about God, suddenly everything's evil. Don't do these things. They're evil. This is evil. This is sinful. Like, lay off, man. Why are you so hung up on these particular actions? This is a system that's doing something awesome. It's making light. There's a lot of actions you can do that are just fine and actually work with the system. If you do this, it disrupts the whole thing. In human beings, the systems that allow us to have loving relationships with each other, develop spiritually, those systems, evil is whenever they are disrupted. Evil and sin, viewed in themselves, are nothing but a rift with goodness. Evil actually consists in disconnection. A cut is just your skin going apart when it should be together. A broken bone is something apart that should be together. God calls certain things evil and says don't do them because they disrupt or destroy the systems that are meant to bring love and connection to human beings. Doing this... That's great. That's good. good. <laughs> I, I send that to my family and they've just gone, that would explain... So well, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Now, I think you, I'll have a coffee with you afterwards and we'll, we'll pick this up because I can see there's... Look, every time you get a piece of the truth, ten more questions are going to open up. So, it's good stuff. But is, is, is it, do you want to keep... There's one, one thing I want to add to it. Yeah, yeah, let's hear from Ian. Yeah. <laughs> We have a very, very narrow um, platform, whatever you like to call it, when it comes to freedom. We haven't got freedom to do everything, yes. either good or bad. Yes. Your freedom is different from mine. Secondly, I just want to endorse what Cor said. We have impulses, like the word about destroys the system. That's what it's... Evil is whatever jiggers up the system. So we've got to watch for whatever jiggers up the system in us. Thirdly, not only is your freedom different than my freedom, but I have inherited inclinations and the proneness to certain areas that you haven't. Fourthly, when I think about judgment, I think about being stripped away of the nurturing, the environment, the background, the experiences that we've been brought up with and have gone through life with. Until we stand bare and are then, in the next world, given a choice. Where do you want to go? The past is absolutely irrelevant mm -hmm. when we get to the next world. We are going to stand or be there and that will be the thing. Where do you want to go? 
I'm not interested in your past. I don't know. God has no interest whatsoever in our past. None whatever. And he doesn't see us through the prism of our past. He sees us in terms of our potential. What can I do with this person? Where can I lead that person? What can I awaken in that person? That's happening all the time we're in this world. It's emphatically the case in the next world. I'm not interested in other than, come on, brother, sister, come on and let's see what we can do that makes your life a richer one mm. than you've had. And that's, that's where it is. So don't go down into the rabbit holes of homosexuality or anything else. It's not the issue. That's their issue to deal with. And we need to just look at people because we've got our own immense shortcomings. And it's, it's not our business even. I don't, sorry, Cynthia, but it's what goes on in other people's lives between them and God. Mm. And I don't get wandering into that area. I think to myself, I don't agree with it, Cynthia, but I, I have no way of knowing. I mean, when I, I, I was, it was a hot topic when I was in England in the 1990s. It's hotter today. Running the college. And, <laughs> um, you know, I, I know all the theories. But the, the, the third month, the third tri uh, yes, the third month of pregnancy, this can happen, that can happen. So all sorts of factors can contribute. So we just don't know. We just got to try and think of it in terms of God. He's not interested in all those factors which are fed into who we are. Many of which have been not of our doing. In fact, the vast majority, are not of our doing. And uh, I'm actually looking forward to. Um, being stripped of my background because mm -hmm. I was brought up in the immediate aftermath of the Depression and the Second World War. And I know that to this day, I carry the um, mm. mindsets of that time and of my parents. And I am mindful of them but can't do anything about them. So I'm waiting till I get into the next world, and then I can be in a much more enlightened state. That stuff's going to be stripped off, and then somebody's going to say to me, Ian, who and what do you really want to be? Mm, beautiful. No, that's great, Ian. That's fantastic. Thanks for prompting us to get to <laughs> what you were saying. One other thing to leave with us, particularly for, for you, Paul, when I used to work with the kids with difficult behaviours for years, you know, you'd... It, it, you don't mean to, but you can you'd see workers putting, you know, why is this child here or why is this child doing that? Other kids can do this, why can't they? And a term that seemed to come up really helped me a lot was distance travelled. You know, I had one, one, one kid I worked with who to get him to go to the shopping centre was a mammoth milestone. And once we did, and he was actually stopped, had anxiety, the world opened up for him. But even just going to the shopping centre was, was a trauma that he couldn't cope with. And so I think that, you know, what Ian's saying too is that the Lord's looking at the distances that we've travelled rather than, you know, whether you're homosexual or not, whether you're this or not. It's the distance that you're travelling and are you truly becoming you? That's, you know, the, the, that, that's what I meant by bringing up hereditary evil versus the evils we choose that we really want. Yeah, okay. So we'll leave it there, but it's going to be a good coffee conversation. Let's, Jane, would you mind reading into the, to the intro? Just underneath there I've written, the word has the power to transform temporal moments, actions and states into eternal spiritual events. This was big for me, sitting down to really try to get to the sense, the deepest sense of this par parable. That's what was coming up for me again and again and again. The, you know... The rich man that had soil that brought forth plentiful is your mind. Your mind is the soil that can bring forth plentiful again and again and again. It, the word can sown into it, can be sown into it, and it can produce incredible things. But are you, you know, is, is your whole belief system and, and your framework about 
what you can create for you, what you can store up to glorify you, or is your mind being used to create a better world? Because heaven and hell are the creation of man. They really are. And hopefully each one of us here by the grace and power of Jesus Christ is going to make heaven better. It's Just that not, bit better. It's not, it's not what you do, it's why. It, it's all of it, isn't it? It is what and why. It's, all, it's not just one, is it? No, it, it's definitely right, yeah. So let's, let's keep that in their mind as we dig into this parable. Would you go take us through the intro, Jane, and then we'll... Uh, excellent so far, but let's hook on in so we can get through the parable this, this week. Without genuine spiritual perception, our ego believes that it is the source of all goodness and fruitfulness in our lives. We owe all to the source of life, the Lord. We owe all. When we have a living acknowledgement of the divine as the source, we seek to live a useful life that helps others to succeed and prosper. When we lack spiritual perception, we also lack the true meaning and purpose of our earthly existence. Without wisdom, insight, and purpose, the soul will not ponder life's true meaning. Instead, we will become distracted by merely acquiring this world's goods. When preoccupied with this pursuit, the soul becomes lacking and unprepared for the next life after the death of the body. Therefore, this world's riches are not the real concern of this parable. Wealth in the hands of the spiritually minded empowers their life to become wonderful, deep, and meaningful. It aids our goal of stepping into eternity now. Equally, wealth separated from one's life purpose will blind those who have no desire to understand the true meaning of our existence and thereby limit each moment to the temporal and that which is passing away. Mm. Okay, any thoughts or comments on that? We move. Well, for me, yep. uh, it, 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 <coughs> the, the thought comes up here, here all the time as people say, oh, that's just who I am. It's me. This, this is me. This is who I am. And that gives a fallacy of, well, I can't change. Right. Or, you know, th this, this is it. When yeah. the reality is, you cannot stay stagnant. No, that's true. It, you, you either go this way or you go that way. But every opportunity that you reaffirm what you, what you are or believe to be or what you choose, you reaffirm, reaffirm every, every, every moment. So whichever direction that is in, more towards affirming me yourself. And I can't learn anymore. I'm not open to hearing anymore because, you know, I know everything, you know. Or it is, you know, which is the rich, rich fool. The rich fool. Rich, rich yeah. Fool. Or it's like, well, hang on a moment. Let me park aside the idea that I think that I'm pretty clever. <laughs> yep, okay. And go like, well, maybe, maybe I can learn something. Maybe I can change. Maybe there is something else to it. Maybe I haven't got it all right. You know, it's, it's one of those two. But when you say... I am, this is me. You're and blocking kind of yourself. Blocking You're blocking yourself, yeah, yeah. And therefore reaffirming the choice again that you, have, that, that, that you are yourself. Well, you, uh, here's an example. Alcoholism runs in my family. So in my 20s and 30s, it was, oh, it runs in my family. It's not me. Mm. That's just so I seem to justify. Until I, my dad stopped drinking, and I saw how different he was, and I started thinking, hang on, what made him, he used to use it as an excuse, what's he, they started reflecting and started seeing how he was instead of, I just hereditary sin that I had drive me for what I do. And that mindset is just kind of what, what we're talking about. So you, you're using things that you think are out of your control as an excuse to do things, but as soon as you mm. start to wake up and go, oh, I was going to say profanity there, um, um, you wake up and you go, hang on, this isn't functional. Hey, I was using that as an excuse, a hereditary mm. sin, and mm. I just hope that my boys don't carry on that gene and use it as an excuse. Now, now you're getting right to the crux of, I think, what makes change. You know, we, we often do reflect on ourselves and change because we realise it's not just me that gets the benefit of that change. It's everyone around me. Now, that's beautiful, Chris. That, and that's love, isn't it? That's mm -hmm. That makes me want to think about this. Um, when you're saying here that um, to really use for 
God that helps others to succeed and prosper. Mm. First and foremost, we have to seek that in ourselves. Yes, that's so and true. And when we are developing that within ourselves, it does come out and help others. And I think that comes back to also what you know, we've discussed before, that you know, who am I to judge others? Yes. You know, we've all got our different paths. Yes. And, and it's really important that we can find that connection between, because, you know, as you were saying, as we are part of God, and it's the connection between us and God. Yes. And it's the most important. Most important. Yeah, oh, beautiful. And then, then it percolates out. That's lovely. It, it, there's an extension of that. There was something I was talking about um, a few days ago with Sal and, and, and others as well. The whole idea that peer pressure and religion is one example of extreme peer pressure that is, that is evil. It's not evil necessarily because it's a bit oppressive, but what it does when you have these, these external factors from society being placed upon you mm -hmm. or everybody acquiesces to certain kind of norms, mm -hmm. It keeps everybody down, but if people are feeling that calling and, and that openness to be themselves and express what is within, and experience that both good and bad, because if it goes bad, you go, oh, well, I heard pe I heard maybe people maybe by my choice. Need, maybe I yeah, yeah. need to change. You know, yeah, yeah. It's one of the key decisions I've had early in my life to go like, I don't stop expressing what I express or doing what I do, but if it comes out as not right, then. I'll need to change. Yeah. So it's yeah. not changing just to keep it within the same, but it's to be honest with, with the way I express myself. Mm. But, if, but if we give people the power to be free and express themselves, be their true self, so to speak, even though the self can change, and allow them to shine, and not judge each individual action. Distance travel. Can you, can you imagine Distance how travel. The, the, the world, how everybody gets lifted with the energy and the enthusiasm and the differences, the nuances of everybody being different mm -hmm. instead of being the same. Yet the world, unfortunately, goes in the exact opposite. Right? But it, we have to find the permission within to be that in spite of the external pressures. And yeah. that is, look, I'm, I'm 50. <laughs> I'm only just starting to learn that. that <laughs> is how difficult is that? You know what I mean? Plenty of time, young fella. Plenty well, we of can. time. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, mm, yes. Say, yeah. oh, they, you know, they've got their act together. Where, what's wrong with me? And again, that's coming back to what you're saying, how we can come to understand that you know, we don't need to be looking out all the time. We've mm. got to, it's, you know, and I'm, I won't say how old I am, but I'm <laughs> coming to that. I have to, I have to look with me. 25. <laughs> 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 Yes. Trying to not look out as much, but mm. look within and find that connection with our Lord mm. and, and really feel that in a way that's more tangible. One, One of the, the best, best tools I have found for that work is reminding myself that the external world is a reflection of my inner state. Now, we're all sharing that. We're all sharing. This external world is directly affected by all our minds. It really is. So I'm, I'm, I, I can't take responsibility for everything out there, but at least what's coming to me. You know, one of the ways I really learned to stop judging other people is by going, if I'm seeing something wrong in them, I'm really seeing something wrong in myself. And that's okay, because until I see it, I can't work on it. So that, that, that's a good tool is the, what I think of as the mirror effect. You know, people, the Lord does bring people into your life to mirror certain messages over and over and over again until we kind of get it. Well, Dr. Noel just sent Jane something yesterday, pretty much what you were saying. It, like, it goes for 30 seconds. Go on, Chris. Dr. Noel, he's not here, but listen, look, this is just beautiful the way. In like, human life, there is a something called the turning point of time. It may be 30, it may be 60. In Christian religion, we call it rebirth, a new life. We go take some uh, blessings from the pastor or a priest and then we say, I am reborn. But what Swedenborg talks about the rebirth is regeneration. What is regeneration? 
So all your ego, your senses, everything goes down in your life and a spiritual dimension takes over. Only when you become spiritual, you will be able to understand who is this man called the Swedenborg. If you are not a spiritual person, if you are an academician, if you are a researcher, if you are a novelist, you will take him for granted as another person. Unfortunately, Swedenborg is not another person. <laughs> oh, I feel like I'd have to add that because when Jennifer. I'll have to tell Dr. Noel we got him here. Like, he was here. Yeah, I felt like he was here. Right? <laughs> That's beautiful. He might watch it anyway. Yes, so. good. That's excellent. Jane, go on, read us a bit more. Let's get stuck into the parable. That was, thank you, Chris. That was good. But God said unto him, the power of divine truth to lift any spiritual or natural truth to restore an eternal use or practice. Thou fool, the natural understanding of life devoid of spiritual dimension. This night thy soul shall be required of thee, then, those shall, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? A revelation of the temporal and illusionary nature of earthly life. Further evidence that this is the real purpose purport of this parable is found in this question asked by the Lord. What happens to your possessions when you die? The answer is that we cannot keep them. If we love our possessions too much and attempt to find happiness in them, we will lose our life. Instead, if we use them to assist our true purpose in elevating the soul, leaving possessions behind is no issue. All that we truly own are the loves we carry and cherish in our soul. Now I want to jump in there quickly and talk about a memorable experience Swedenborg has where he's kind of talking about people that are you know, covetous for gold and things without a spiritual use. And he would say, you know, he, he walked into this situation where the soul was sitting there in a dark cave with a candle burning, counting all their gold in the spiritual world. They're doing this, counting all the gold. And then as this is what Swedenborg is seeing what's going on in their mind. And then kind of like the light of heaven comes in and they're sitting there playing with dirt. They're just, you know, just playing with dirt. It's my gold. It's my gold. And this is, you know, this is the nature of the mind. You know, when, when the mind is lifted up into the light of heaven, we see things as they really are. But when, we're, when, when it's not, when we're caught up in love of self and things like that, then... The ego will paint everything in an illusion, in an illusion in that sense. And, and so, Scrooge, Scrooge yeah, was, it, yes, so Christmas time is Scrooge. And then he was a yes, well said, Paul. That's very true. And this is, you know, but, but this is not to judge because we all do it. We were all children playing with our marbles once. Give me back my marble. I'm using an analogy, but you know, even today we still feel the pain and angst over losing something, you know, and. And that's okay, it's part of the process. What we've just got to keep reminding ourselves is I'm on a journey here. I'm on a journey here. This is, this is not the, the end goal. This is a part of a process for something much better. That was lovely. Jay, can I get you to do a little bit more reading? Or does anybody else want to comment before we do? Comment or? Well, on the journey to hell. <laughs> and all we can try and do is, is try to help them see the destruction that they're headed towards. But you know, the, the saying is you can, you, know, you can lead the horse to water. You can't make it drink, can you? Yeah, I've got something to say. Just yep. the whole thing about what's in, what's not, and all that. Yeah, yeah. What was coming to me was, it's it's person, it's a personal relationship. So what's right for one person, yep. might be wrong for another person, depending on what the Holy Spirit is saying. Like yep. I've got a friend, and he became a Christian, and people are judging him. Oh, how can he be a Christian? He's still doing heroin and all these things, but he's genuinely having a relationship with the Lord. The Lord's not going to zap him and all of a sudden everything's gone. No. As long as he's relating with the Lord yep. and trying to do what the Lord's leading him to, then that's good. But if, if the Lord says, and puts his finger on something and he bites that, that becomes sin to him. Right. So it's all personal. That's why we can't judge another. If God were to zap that man, he'd be a dictator. Yeah. And you can't have a relationship with God where he's dictating. He's loving and you can do this. You can beat this. You can overcome this or whatever it is. Yeah. And that's why I think it was Peter or one of the disciples said, I tell this other disciple to do this. And, and, and Jesus said, hey, that's between me and him. It's none of your business. 
just worry about the edge. Well, did anybody... If I, if I can add an yeah, yeah. analogy. Years yeah. ago, a good friend of ours from a Baptist church when we were doing Bible study, he, he, he kind of exp expressed this and it stuck with me because it's such a nice little little way of describing what you're saying is that because when we're judging and, and you know, a person says, hi, oh, this is what I see on the road. So we're on the road, I don't know where, where, where do you live or down to Canberra, where, it doesn't matter what road you're on, and you're describing what you see. Oh, there's trees there, there's a river there, and they go like, hang on, I don't see a tree, I don't see a river. But you're on the same road. But, but what you're seeing around and what you're experiencing is very different. Doesn't mean you're not on the same road. It's mean a different part of the, of the road. You yeah. know? Different, uh, part of the, different part of the road. Different part of the road. And yeah, that's how nicely I, put. That's, that's stuck yeah. with me. And they go like, that's, that's the whole thing about judgment. They go, just because you don't see the tree yeah. doesn't mean you're not on the same road. You know? let, let me just draw you back to the, to the words of Jesus here for a moment. Right back to the very beginning there. Uh, uh, he, it, it, second line. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Is it, isn't that provocative? Because what is the image that many Christians portray of Jesus? That he's the judge. You know, that he's the king of kings sits on the throne. You better watch out, buddy. Yeah, the executioner. But he's kind of straight. Someone comes up to him to sort of say, fix this. And he's like, you're not getting it. This is your journey. You, you, you know, I'm here to shine light into your life and encourage you. But it's your journey. I'm not your judge. That's profound. Just that right there is profound, isn't it? And it's very easy to miss that one. Okay, so go on, Jane. You're doing such a great job. Read us a few more. <laughs> so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. The lower ego is preoccupation with self-gratification, but no regard for the state of the soul. To be rich towards God means that we care for the state of our soul and that of others. We long for greater resources and gifting so that we may help our brothers and sisters and advance our own souls. In this way, we are laying up treasures for the kingdom of God and not for ourselves. The purpose of life is for one and all to be useful and render use to each other in love and care. This is what the word is teaching us. Natural wealth used for such spiritual purposes blesses everyone especially the steward of the wealth. On the other hand, such riches, if spent solely on selfish pleasures, become a bondage to the temporary owner. Spiritual riches consist of a good character and the willingness to make others happy. Such an advancing soul is pleasing to God and the Lord will prosper them in every way. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And you know all these things shall be added unto you because we often quote that, don't we, Chris? It's one I've quoted many times over the years. I hear friends say it. The, the disciples were saying, we've given up houses. Some of us have given up families and, and friends. You know, what are we going to get? He says, you know, he, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added back unto you. You know, it's not like I'm so spiritual I can't be concerned about having a home or family and friends and all that sort of stuff, you know. That's part of a spiritual life. Having somewhere to rest your head, somewhere to, having family, somewhere to cook a meal, somewhere to care for people. It, it gets right down to the very core of what it is to be spiritual. You know, am I actually helping people, helping myself and others? That's the core of it. You can go sit in a tent somewhere and say, I'm so spiritual, I own nothing. And you, you have nothing as well, no spiritual work at all. There's nothing there in it. It's an illusion, a lie. I okay. think Morgan Freeman said, our rent for heaven, for our room in heaven is service to others. I like that. That's mm. beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> That's great. Well, go on, Chris, read something for us now. Does anyone want to comment? <laughs> Again, all of this is dependent on how the Spirit's leading because Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell it all. So for him to hold on to it would have been sin. But for someone else, he might be saying, get a house, dude. Look yes. after your family. And if he doesn't do that, then that's sin for him. So yes, but, it, but you're so right, Chris, because it says he looked at him and he loved him and said, sell all you have and come and follow me. Because he could see what the bondage it was to that man. And that's, and that's ultimately what it is. That was blocking his relationship and intimacy right. with God. Right. So whatever blocks it, is sin when the Lord puts his finger on it. Well put. That's nice. That's why, Chris, what, what you played earlier from Curtis was just beautiful. Uh, the image of the skin cutting and pulling apart, that really, 
you know, it's, it's meant to be bonded together, not bleeding all out. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful, yeah. God's not trying to stop our fun here, folks. He's trying to intensify and enhance our fun. We were made for Eden or delight. Amen. You don't want to read, Chris? No, no feeling to read. Um, I don't know if Aldo wants to read, or you're happy to read, or you want to... Yeah, we're... Thank you, God. And he said... <laughs> and he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Higher revelation is only possible to those who will discipline the mind and heart to know and understand what is from God and what is from self. Any Take comments or thoughts on that? Anyone here feel like they're an expert at knowing in their head what's God and what's himself? I think it'll be over. <laughs> Inner tuition. The inner teacher. Beautiful. And that's coming from a teacher. <laughs> that's great. Go on, go on, Allah, read some more. Mm -hmm. um, take no thought for your life. Anxiety and troubles caused by the selfish pursuit of earthly riches. Um, Inside each one of us, there exists a higher calling that no soul should ever resist. However, earthly life can and often does overwhelm us. In the most literal sense, this passage speaks of the call of death, which no one can prevent. In a higher sense, this is the Lord calling us to discover our true purpose in this life. If we resist this calling, we become the fool who thinks they are rich but are poor towards the real meaning of life and God. True perception frees the soul from temporal anxieties. That's a nice thought, isn't it? Real spiritual perception, when you have it, is free of anxiety. And that's, uh, I don't know if you've been following the Christmas devotions. If you've been following the Christmas, well, I say, if, if, if it's too much, please just ignore them. But one, one of the readings there this morning was just great, where angels really, you know, one angel can send a thousand evil spirits at flight. But that angel's getting its power because it realizes it's a vessel. It doesn't, in fact, the angel, if you ask them, would go, oh, I'm nothing. Honestly, I'm really, I'm nothing. And they have real genuine humility. And the more of that humility we have, the more that power can work through us because the Lord can trust them. But it, you can't fake that. You either really trust, especially when things go wrong, you either really trust the Lord and you find and you perceive that everything is working in your life for your good or you start trying to negotiate with God and wrestle with him and bargain with him please God I'll do this if you do that I'll change that if you change this you know we start instead of just being at peace and trusting and, and it's a journey for all of us but the times where I get it right and I trust him and I let it go I'm always looking back later and going whoa I couldn't have done it that well I couldn't have fixed that problem that well the way God does that reminds me of Jonah, right? He's, he's swallowed up by this big fish, engulfed by this big idea, this, this thing that kept him occupied. You know, his ego. Three days, yeah. His big beasty ego. <laughs> <laughs> and, until the Lord kind of manipulates it and spits him out. Yeah. Anyway, so in spite yeah. of all of that, in spite of what, where we're at and occupied with all of these things, in the end, we're just going to get put on track anyway. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, go on, Aldo, you're doing a great job there. Just pl pl plough us on home here. We're almost finished for the day. Uh, what ye shall eat. Trust, peace and reassurance that the Lord can and will lead the advancing soul into the deeper, sen deeper inner sense of the Logos. And what I'm meaning by that is that we're having a circle right now and hopefully to some degree you're having aha moments. You're having some moments that are really going, wow, I'm getting this. Or maybe you're having some wrestling. Oh, I'm really struggling with that. But either way, hopefully you're not falling asleep. Either way, you're having an encounter with the Lord. You're actually having an encounter with him deep inside you right now. And what I find when I, yeah, what I find when I get to that real inner sense of what the word is saying, it's like meeting an old friend that you haven't seen for the longest time 
But it's almost like no time at all has gone by. You just find it so easy to spend time with that person. That's the inner sense of the word. It is the Lord. The inner sense is the light of God and heaven. And, and that's where we find that peace. It deposits deep into our soul. And, and this is incredible that we've been given a book called the Bible. If you can read past its literal sense and have an encounter with its inner sense, you will start to find real relationship and encounters with God that, 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 that the soul longs for. Peace and joy and moments. And you'll find whether you're watching the sh a TV show or you're having a conversation with friends or you're driving, there's this other conversation going on. Little, little moments where you're seeing things that others are not seeing. It just jumps out at you. That's that relationship with God. Isn't that exciting? It's wonderful. May we all have more of that today, Lord. Go on, Aldo, take us home. We're nearly there. Uh, yeah, this, this goes back to take no thought. Right. For what, she, what you shall eat, neither for the body, right. what you shall put on. Uh, the Lord will provide the protection necessary for spiritual advancement through the inner sense joined to the literal sense of the Logos. Excellent. That's great. Any thoughts or comments on that? No? We're good? Keep going. Oh. oh, I'm using the word logos because we fall asleep to the sound of good teaching sometimes. It, it means the word in its fullness. The logos is, you know, in the beginning was the logos. That's what it says in the Greek. It's the very frequency that's holding this room together right now. But in the beginning was the word. And that word has taken a form in a book, surprisingly through human authors, which we can encounter any time we want to pick it up and read it. We just got to realize it's there. You know, you know I, I get the Bible's not an easy book to read sometimes. So you mean like the form of spirit? The literal sense of the word plus its spiritual sense, the divine, the divine in every sense of the word. Yeah. The spirit of truth, yep. So this is like that experience of um, where uh, in a time of crisis where uh, something of it cra the meaning of it cracks open. Yes. And, and, we, and it suddenly becomes a living thing rather than just this... this uh, yeah. Uh, and a meme, uh, yeah. uh, a sound bite, a fancy yeah. thing that we say to each other often and don't even really quite get it. Yeah. The literal word is like the physical body. Yeah, yeah beautiful. The way I think of it. It's beautiful, yeah. So it's got to serve what's behind it. I don't know. That's so great, Chris. Right. Yeah. No, that's good, Chris. That's good. You know when you're really having getting to the inner sense because you will struggle to, it's like you're getting it, but then you'll struggle to communicate that to other people. If you're struggling, yeah. you're getting it. Okay, you just got to then also ask for the wisdom to try and, try and transfer that to everyone. All right, would, uh, Sean, would you read us the last couple and then the, and then the conclusion? And we made it to the end of the, we went a couple minutes over. Your boss? <laughs> yeah, come on, come on, Sarah, take us home. <laughs> it's a life, no? Yeah. The life. life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. The externals of life are important. However, righteousness established in the heart and the mind is what leads to internal life. Natural knowledge alone leaves the mind ignorant of uh, spiritual realities. In this state of darkness, we see what is of benefit to self as good. We believe we are rich in goodness when, in fact, real goodness seeks to bless others. The power to know the difference is only available to the higher selfless ego. Right. When I, when I talk about lower ego and higher ego, what I'm, what I'm trying to help us understand is that God's goal is not to bring us to, and this is no discredit to anybody who's come from that kind of background, it's not to bring us to a nirvan state of, of absolute egolessness. That's not the goal. That's a part of the goal at times. Day two, we have these moments of being egoless so we can get a better perspective. Then we need to come back in and re-engage. But, you know, in Christian circles, we talk about the resurrection. What we're talking about is that each one of us gets to keep our ego, but now it's an angelic ego. It, it's, it's, 
a sense of self that I am created to fulfill your life and your life and yours. And I have to worry about mine because everyone else is created to, to, to help me as well. That, that selfless ego. So you don't become some kind of blank uh, nothingness. That's not God's plan to be, you know. Amazing thought, isn't it? Okay, keep, keep going. Thank you, Sarah. Keep going. Conclusion. This parable calls us to pause, consider, and observe what our lives will add up to once our days have been spent. What does the Lord require of us? What account must we give for our soul and life? Armed with these questions, sacred, sacred text implores us to seek the Lord and find our fulfillment in his purpose for our lives. Although such a journey is uh, challenging, the Lord promises that it is the uh, richest and the most rewarding path. On the other hand, a life of uh, temporal, sensual pleasure is fleeting while its stronghold upon the soul is everlasting. To combat such challenges, the Lord seeks to invade the realm of the temporal and fill each moment with the fragrance of heaven. Such heavenly encounters will free up the stronghold of the lower ego and release us from the cares of this world into the joy of everlasting love where eternity embraces the now. From this elevated state, we can find rest from the lower ego as we seek the way forward to the internal city of light. Even the briefest, briefest glimpses of the heavenly city can fill us with strength and renewed vigor as we continue our quest, quest to our lasting home. Wonderful. Thank you. That was lovely. So here's the focus for you, if you so wish, don't have to. Look to introduce a daily practice, maybe several times a day if possible, of pausing and observing the temporal nature of earthly life. Allow your mind and heart to touch the eternal realm as you ground yourself in the truth that you are an eternal soul, a child of God. Now, I'd just like to finish with one last example um, from myself, you know, where I believe our goal is to live in peace. We should be living in that peace always. That's day seven. But this is a journey. And so you'll find yourself there several times during the day, and then you'll find yourself not there, you know, troubled. And it could be something someone says. Often it'll be someone, something someone says or does especially if you love them, and they trouble you. And then you're very troubled, and now you're, you've lost that peace. And you're wrestling, and you're trying, to, you know, whether it be you're trying to gaslight them, control them, manipulate them, or you're actually genuinely trying to help them. Whatever's going on there, you've just kind of sunk into your own personal little hell. And the Lord is trying to sort of bring you back out into a state of where you can just be. Just be with people, just be in this moment. Look, it could be you're driving down the street and someone screamingly cuts across you, your heart's pacing, and you think, oh, I'm thinking words about this person I don't want to even utter. Boy, if I could have five minutes of their time and tell them what an idiot they are, or whatever, whatever, whatever. Again, you've sunk into your own personal little hell. And the Lord, the Lord doesn't want us to ignore these things. They're very important real events because they grow us. But here's what I would say. How long did it take the Lord to lift you up out of that? Was it five minutes? Was it five hours? Did you feel begrudgingly towards that person for five days? How long? That's the test of how well you're doing. You know, how you're going here. Don't be put off by the fight. That's good. Just go, okay, Lord, I'm really struggling right now. And Darren was saying, you want peace for me. Help me. And let the Lord lift you up out of that little hell that you've been in and lift you back up into a moment where 
heaven can just wash over you with peace and reassurance it's all going to be okay, it's all going to work, and you'll laugh about this, I promise, tomorrow or maybe the next day. Let's bow our heads and pray. For this me. Dear Lord, help me to live with you in the now. To be like a child that is in awe of each moment, of each breath, of each heartbeat. Lord, when I'm distracted, bring me back and let me be swift to hear your calling. Amen. Yeah, well, we did well. We, we only 45 minutes, uh, an, an hour and 40, 15 minutes instead of the usual. So we did excellent. Great stuff we brought up there. We better have coffee now. <laughs> I hope everyone's been edified and you've come away from the sacred circle. Encounter, encouraged. Next year we'll be able to work from books. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a big, yes, it's been such a process. Well, one of my, one of my real hopes, Jennifer, is that um, I kind of realised you know, the longer I've done the role, the turn it off. learning from others mistakes.